Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I hope and trust that you are all well. Do you have a lot of accounts or social media and can't remember your passwords or are using the same password for everything? Do you ever forget your passwords? Well, all of that's okay, because Aura is helping me keep track of these accounts and passwords with its easy-to-use app that contains a password manager. They're also sponsoring today's video. Their easy-to-use app helps me generate strong and complex passwords when I set up new accounts and it remembers them for me when I need to sign in on a browser or on a mobile device. Using the same password twice is just asking for trouble. And that's why you need a good password manager, and that's just one of the many features that you're going to get with Aura. Identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, antivirus, and even a VPN, all in a single app. Aura not only gives you identity theft insurance, but it notifies you if your email, passwords, or social security number have been leaked to the dark web. You can even connect your bank accounts and get notified of suspicious transactions. It's absolutely worth seeing what kind of info of yours has been leaked to the dark web, and Aura will tell you. You'll probably be shocked, just like I was. You can try it for free. That's right, no cost up front. And see for yourself when you sign up for a 14-day free trial at my link, Aura.com forward slash Phoenix. Get yourself some peace of mind when you're browsing the internet and see who's been using your data. Go visit my link down below and try it out today. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For when we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Camping Creepy Stories. Right after this intro, an ad will play. I'll read the first story, an ad will play, and there will be no more ads within this video. My family has a camping timeshare, and we used to go camping for weeks at a time in the summer. My dad had to work, so he would stay at home Monday through Thursday and come meet us at the campgrounds on Friday through Sunday. The campgrounds had a pool, miniature golf course, basketball courts, and we'd gone for so long that my mom was comfortable letting us wander since there was only one entrance and exit. When I was around eight, but was small for my age, so I looked around five years old. I met a little boy who was camping with his single dad for a few days. He came to our campsite a lot and knew we were staying for a while. I was pretty sad when he left, but his dad said they'd come back sometime soon. A few weeks later, his dad came to the campsite right after my mom left to take a shower. He told me his son was coming later that week. He asked where my parents were, and I told him my dad doesn't come until Friday, and my mom always takes a shower at this time. He said bye and left. The next day, he came by at the same time and told me that he had just found some kittens and asked if I wanted one. I said yes. He told me he kept them in his tent and I could come pick one. Now, this guy wasn't a stranger. My mom had met him when he picked up his son from our campsite. So I didn't get that creepy stranger vibe and get okay going with him. He walked towards his campsite, but then he told me he had actually moved them to his truck so they wouldn't get too hot, which made sense to me at the time. He pointed towards his truck right outside the gates of the entrance. I start walking towards the entrance with the guy when my dad pulls up. He got the day off work so he could spend more time with us. He asks what's going on, and I said, Tommy's dad said he has kittens in his truck and I can have one. My dad got out of the car, tells me to run back to the campsite, so I do. When my dad gets back, he tells me to never go alone with an adult anywhere, even if I know them. I asked my mom years later about the whole thing, and she told me my dad kicked his ass and called the cops because he was well known for abducting children on those campgrounds. So, myself, 24-year-old trans female, and my sister, 22, went camping this week at a lake 
and came home today a day early. Her friend, 22 as well, came up to hang out the first day and went home since she had to work. Since it's been 90 to 100 the past month, we spent most of our day in our swimsuits, swimming and kayaking in the lake. You know, like any normal person when camping does at the lake. Sure, we were showing some skin, but literally everything that needed to be covered was. Their camp hosts are a married couple, probably in their late 50s. The husband drove by, checked that we were the ones with the reservation, and drove off in his golf cart. A little while later, my sister and her friend went to the bathrooms in their swimsuits right after the husband had refilled the toilet paper. According to them, he stared at them the entire time, creeped them out, but they just went back to the water. Later that evening, the wife gave me our pass and we chatted a bit, and she seemed normal enough. The next day, however, she started talking about how her husband was talking about us. Apparently, he told her to check out the hot girls in sight eight, and that he appreciated our womanly attributes, aka our chests and butts. She even laughed and said, he's married, but not dead yet. After all that, she looked at my sister, then at me, and asked, so you guys are leaving Wednesday, right? In a tone that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end, and my gut screamed, run. I confirmed, and she left. That evening, they spent a lot of time with the campers next to us, the husband finding the perfect spot to sit and stare at my sister on the hammock. I immediately grabbed a camp chair and sat so I blocked his view of her. He stayed there well over an hour and just kept looking at us. We texted our parents when we got cell service and let them know we'd head home the next day, a day earlier than planned. We wrote everything down and planned to file a complaint with the state forestry. Luckily today went without any issues and were home safe, sound, and royally creeped out and pissed the hell off. This won't be amongst the creepiest stories, but for me, it was very scary and has always left me wondering and scarred. When I was five, I went camping with my dad and stepmom in the Angeles National Forest. We drove farther out than the official campsite, but not too much farther. Right off the dirt road, there was a really large clearing. You could tell other people camped there sometimes by the fire spot in the center far from the trees. So, after some hiking and roasting hot dogs by our fire, we went to sleep pretty late. My dad had an old Toyota with a camper on it, so him and my stepmom laid in the camper, and I laid across the front bench seat. There was a little sliding window inside the truck, between me and where they were laying, and the truck was all locked, so it felt safe except that window was shut because my dad snores. I fell asleep and sometime later was awakened by the sound of someone tapping on the truck door window. My head was by the driver's side window and the tapping was at the passenger window by my feet. The sound immediately scared me and I didn't open my eyes. I knew it couldn't be my dad because he would have just knocked on that inside window or opened it if he needed to tell me something. The tapping kept up, about seven taps at a time. Then they would wait a few seconds and do it again. It sounded like they were tapping just loud enough to wake me, but not my dad. I considered the possibility of a tree branch touching the window, but remembered how far away the trees were. I could still hear my dad lightly snoring from the camper. Sometimes the tapping sounded like a short fingernail. Sometimes it just sounded like a padded fingertip. I was scared to death and could hear my heart pounding and my mind was racing. Suddenly, the tapping started on the driver's side window right above my head. I almost jumped out of my skin and twitched all over. My face had to have shown my fear and shown that I was not sleeping. I was too scared to scream or call my dad. 
I felt like I had to lay as still as possible and tried to fake like I was asleep. Not the smartest idea, but I was only five. It also didn't sound like an animal. It just sounded like a human finger, tapping, then pausing. It happened for maybe an excruciating three minutes, and the last two sets of tapping were the loudest. Then it stopped. I still kept my eyes shut the whole time, terrified of what I might see, until I fell asleep at some point. In the morning, I looked around at how far the truck was from the trees and everything else, and knew it couldn't have been any of that. I told my dad and stepmom about it. She seemed kind of uninterested, but my dad seemed really perplexed and concerned, and was very glad the truck was locked. So, whoever kept tapping on the window that night, I hope we don't get to meet you. I work in the outdoor field and lead trips regularly. I once led a trip to the top of Mount Stringer in North Carolina. It's a tough climb to get to the top and about six miles from the nearest road. I was leading a group of eight middle school kids and had one co-instructor. We were camping out on top of the mountain and it was a beautiful night with a full moon. The kids and the other co-instructor went to bed in their tents. I chose to spend the night in a hammock that night. I was really into a book I was reading, so I stayed up and read until about 10.30 p.m. I turned my headlamp off to settle in for the night. Everything around me was rather bright from the moon, and from the position I was in, I could see down the trail we had hiked to get to the top. I laid there enjoying the scenery and noticed something moving on the trail. Bears are common in this area, so I perked up. As it got closer, I could tell it was a person. We were in the middle of nowhere, and there was someone hiking up the trail with no headlamp or any gear. I was just frozen, watching this person move closer to our camp. They arrived at the top of the mountain where we were and just stopped. I watched as what appeared to be a man surveyed our camp. I really could only see the outline of him. He stood there for what seemed like 30 minutes, but may have been 10. He then turned, sat down under a tree facing our camp. He was sitting up in a way that I knew he wasn't trying to sleep. He just sat there staring at our camp. I had no idea what to do. I decided to wait it out. I waited, just staring at the man while he stared at my camp. This went on until about 3.30 a.m. Then, he stood up, took a moment to survey my camp a few minutes longer, and then went back down the trail he came up on. I, to this day, have no idea what that was all about, but it freaked me out. I was paranoid that we were being followed for the rest of the trip. My friends and I found a 22-year-old girl, face down in the mud, both legs broken, with compound fractures. She had no cell phone, no water, no food, and nothing to keep her warm. Her friend was deceased. A little backstory. My two friends and I were hiking in a pretty popular spot in our area. It's a 150-foot waterfall that takes about 45 minutes of uphill hiking to get to. We decided to go bouldering around the bottom of the waterfall. There are various little pools and boulders where the water runs off from the waterfall. This bouldering trail is not on the main trail and not many hikers ever bear off the main trail. When we found her, obviously we called 911 and gave her any supplies we had. Eventually, a helicopter showed up and they flew her to the nearest hospital. Turns out, she was hiking and camping with her friend the night before, when they both fell off the waterfall. Her friend must have gone to get help, but unfortunately, died less than a hundred yards from where we found the girl. So, no one knew she was hurt, or that she was even there. 
It's a miracle she was still alive and mind-blowing to think what she had gone through when we found her 20 hours later. Before we found the hiker, we were climbing rocks in the area and taking pictures. We didn't even notice the poor girl was in the background of our photos. I was once canoeing the boundary waters between Minnesota and Canada. These aren't your normal backyard ponds. The boundary waters are thousands of enormous lakes interconnected with each other. Think many great lakes. We had been canoeing and camping along the lakes for about a week at this point. We didn't really have an itinerary, just planned a boat and camp, fish and live off the land for two weeks. We had a GPS and a satellite phone to call a helicopter for pickup whenever we are done. Anyway, about a weekend and we were set to canoe a few hours to the next lake. An hour or so in and we were in the center of an extremely long and narrow lake. Unfortunately, a storm started to blow in and the waves on the lake swelled to two plus feet. Too much for our dinky canoes. We pull off to a random clearing on the shore and set up camp and rush to avoid being totally thrashed by a rainstorm. We just set up camp and hunker down for the night. By the next morning, it had cleared up. We started walking up the coast of the lake about 200 feet from our camp, looking for a good fishing spot. What we actually found was another campsite. However, it was absolutely wrecked. Trash strewn everywhere, tent collapsed and torn, clothes on the ground. At first, we were just like disgusted, like what assholes did this, or let their shit out to be bear food. The more we looked around though, the weirder things seemed. For one, their garbage was still hoisted into a tree to keep it safe from bears, but the whole bag was ripped open despite being 30 feet in the air. Second, literally everything except the canoes were still at the campsite. Clothes, packs, food, rope, pans, like a serious set of hiking equipment. Enough for two or three people. Half of it was trashed and torn open, mostly the packs, tent, and clothes. The other half was totally untouched, but thrown on the ground, like somebody noped the hell out of there in nothing but their long johns, ditching hundreds of dollars of gear in the process. We waited a couple hours and eventually called it back to our helicopter crew, but they hadn't been aware of anybody else or gotten any distress calls. We eventually just left everything and moved to camp. Everybody was pretty upset by it, and a day or two later, we ended the whole trip early because it seemed like nobody wanted to be out anymore. It was the weirdest thing I'd ever seen. First thought was a bear attack, but there was food left uneaten, and I've seen bear attacks on camps before, trust me, but nothing like this. Bears rip open packs and go after food and are generally pretty easy to scare away. What still sticks with me is why all their clothes and packs were still there, with half being totally destroyed and half being totally untouched. I still don't get it. I've done a lot of other camping and hiking, rafting and biking all around the country, and I've never had any other weird experiences like that one. This is not something I experienced, but my sister and her husband did. My family used to have a cabin on a lake in the North Woods. It's a lake with no public access. On the other side is, or was, an old girls camp that the state was letting fall apart. The camp had a large two-story main house that was mostly intact at the time. My sister and her husband decided to check out the camp one day. They canoed over and started to walk around. They went into the main house first. They walked around for a bit, and then they heard heavy footsteps upstairs. These footsteps turned into someone running heavily towards the stairs. 
My sister and her husband booked it out of the house, but they could hear the steps coming down the stairs and on the main level as they ran out. They opted to run around the house instead of heading back to the shore. They never saw who it was, but they heard them enter back into the house, and then they heard them storm back outside again. They went into the woods this time and heard someone running in the woods after them. They took the long way around the lake back to the cabin. My dad and I had to go back later that day to get the canoe. We never heard or saw anything. Me and my ex-girlfriend decided to have a date night in my truck out in the middle of nowhere since we both had the day off work. So, we did the usual dinner and a movie thing, and afterwards, we decided we'd go for a midnight drive. So, we drive about an hour and a half out of town, going nowhere in particular. We just knew that we were going to get it on under the stars. After scoping out a random dirt road, I took my truck down it and parked in an open area off to the side next to the forest. The entire area was surrounded by forest. After about 10 minutes of making out, we decide to get down to business. So we get in the back seat and start tearing each other's clothes off. About five minutes in, headlights. Headlights heading towards where we were, but not directly at us. So we are both rushing in an attempt to get our clothes back on, thinking for some reason it might be the cops which makes absolutely no sense now. My pants are nowhere to be found, and neither is her shirt. Now, keep in mind, the closest house to the road we were on is probably 30 minutes away. We kept fumbling, looking for our clothing, and eventually found it and struggled to get them back on. A truck keeps getting closer and closer, but like I said, not directly at us until we finally realize it's not somebody coming to yell at us to get off their property or the cops. In fact, they can't even tell we are there because my truck is black and I'm parked almost into the thick forest area. Finally, an old beat up F-150 parks his truck about 50 feet from us, leaves his truck running and he gets out. He walks to his truck bed grabs his shovel and just starts digging into the ground. He did this for a good 30 to 40 minutes while we just sat there in silence, afraid to move or speak on the off chance he hears us. He stops digging and lifts something out of the ground. It was a decent sized object, but it was too dark to see exactly what it was. Picks it up, places it in his truck bed, goes back for the shovel and places that in the truck bed as well and drives off into the night. Me and my girlfriend decides it would be best to wait another 20 minutes before we even started the truck. To this day, I have no idea what it could have been, but I really hope it was, at worst, just drugs. This happened two years ago, August 11th, 2018 to be precise, and since the anniversary just passed, I thought I should finally share the story. My fiancé and I were on the second night of our two-night camping trip at a popular campground about a half hour from where we live. For reference, my fiancé is black. We live in a predominantly white, conservative, and racist area. This is important later. On our first night, we kept hearing noises in the woods around us. The campsite right beside ours to the right was occupied, but the one to the left was not. The campsites are about 150 yards apart. We had camped here in the same exact plot the year before. Needless to say, we were familiar with the area and the various kinds of animals that live in the woods. The first night, we heard shuffling around our tent. It was obviously something large moving around. We brushed it off and assumed it was just a deer. Now, back to the main event. 
On August 11th, we spent the day at the battlefields, a town over with my family. They had all been invited to join us for the day by my fiancé as a surprise for me while he proposed to me. We stayed with my family until the evening, about 6 p.m., before heading back to our campsite. When we got back, things were really odd. Someone had obviously been in our tent. Our blankets were thrown around, clothes were on the floor, and my backpack had been rearranged and I was missing underwear. But hey, we were just stupid 19-year-olds and decided that since whoever had busted in and left and hadn't taken anything important, it was fine and they wouldn't come back. So we set up a campfire and set out until it was dark, roasting hot dogs and s'mores, smoking cigarettes, and celebrating our engagement. Around 9.30 p.m., we put out our fire and decided to go into our tent for the night to celebrate a little more. Nothing too loud or obnoxious. Immediately after we finished, we started to hear the noises outside of our tent again. But this time we focused in. We heard clear footsteps, and at one point, a man whispering. We looked at each other and our eyes got wide. Someone was definitely walking around outside our tent. We were still and completely silent, just listening to the footsteps, and we heard whispering again. Shit. Make that two men walking around our tent. As if we had the ability to read minds, my fiancé said, I have to go to the bathroom. And I agreed. The bathroom was up the hill from our site. Most people who were in lower sites like ours drove their cars up to the bathroom. Now here is the part I still get chills thinking about. We got up and were getting dressed. My fiancé had just turned on the light in our tent and put his binder on when a man spoke directly to us from right outside the tent. What are you doing? I can't even describe how malicious and menacing this voice sounded. It was clearly directed at us, and he said it with a snicker. He was watching us through the walls of the tent. Again, for this part, we were stupid 19-year-olds. So we decided to just run for it to the car. My fiancé grabbed his pocket knife and his keys and stepped out of the tent. He pulled me with him, and we ran like hell to the car. I heard the footsteps running behind us and then turning and running up to another campsite. At the bathroom, we talked over our options. We talked about sleeping in the car or driving into the town. Then we had another idea. We drove back down to our campsite and began packing everything into our car. At this point, it was around midnight. We moved faster than I think either of us thought possible, wrapping up the tent with our belongings still in it and, and grabbing our folding chairs. We were all packed in five minutes and hopped into the car to leave. I jumped out at the end of the drive and grabbed our nameplate, which had my full name on it, off of the post. As we pulled out of the campsite, I saw our assailants for the first time. Stalking through the woods onto our campsite were two tall white men. I realized that these were the same men who had been driving past our campsite the whole time we were there, just glaring at us and muttering to each other. One was wearing camo hunting gear, and the other was wearing a Confederate flag tank top. Both were carrying large hunting knives, unsheathed, and at the ready. They turned when they saw our car driving away, and one started to make chase until the other stopped him. I made eye contact with the man in camo, and he smiled the most terrifyingly evil smile at me and shook his head slowly. We drove the long way home taking all the weirdest, hardest-to-follow roads and called my dad so he would know we were coming. When we got home, we told my dad everything and he shrugged it off as us being paranoid. So I never told anyone else besides all of you now. I am convinced to this day that this was going to be a racially motivated attack. The campground was not heavily populated and my fiancé was the only non-white person at any of the campsites. 
It was no accident that the two men who had been shadowing us since our arrival and wore Confederate flags and had one on their truck decided to target the interracial couple. I still get cold chills when I think about how close we were to being killed or seriously hurt that night and just how lucky we were that our reckless plan to just make a run for it worked. So, to those men who stalked our campsite with the hunting knives, I hope we don't run into you again. Thank you all for listening to my story. Make sure the next time you go camping, you take in your surroundings and always remain safe. I apologize in advance if this is not as climactic as some might like, but it was a very creepy encounter nonetheless. Last August, my husband, who was 21, and I, 22, decided to go camping for a few days to celebrate our anniversary. We live in Oregon and prefer to dry camp. If you don't know what that is, essentially it's just going out into the woods finding a secluded area and setting up camp. We do this specifically to be away from people. This trip, we decided to go somewhere new. We drove across the river into Washington and ended up in Cougar, Washington at Merrill Lake. There were a few campgrounds near the lake that weren't too packed, but like I said before, we prefer to be secluded. So we kept driving far past the campgrounds, several miles into the woods. My husband was driving while I was scouting for a spot that looked promising enough for us to pull over and check out. After driving for over 20 minutes, we decided to pull over into a random spot that was flat enough and allowed us to drive our vehicle slightly off the road. We got out of the car and began scouting the area. It didn't look too promising at first, but we walked down a small hill and found a perfect spot to set up camp. It was a short enough walk that we could move our camping gear from the car and far enough from the road that we were tucked away and not visible to passerbys. Keep in mind that our car was still visible from the road, so passerbys could still obviously tell that there were people around. Our first night was great, no weirdness, the second day at night, I can't say the same. Around noonish on our second day, we were sitting around the fire pit, which was still slightly lit from breakfast, when all of a sudden, we hear footsteps approaching our campsite. We thought this was a little strange, considering we were in the middle of a huge, empty forest, and they had literally miles upon miles of forest to choose from. Maybe I'm just antisocial, but... I go out into the forest to get away from humans, not find them. We wait to see who it is approaching us, and it's two men, probably in their mid to late twenties. They start getting closer to our site, and my husband acknowledges them and said hello. They said hello to us, but one of the guys made sure to lift his shirt up, revealing a pistol, and had his hand resting on his gun the entire conversation. They eventually made their way past us, and for whatever reason, decided to set up camp probably 30 to 40 yards behind us. At this point, I started feeling weird about them, and told my husband that the whole situation seemed really weird. He agreed, but we didn't want to let it ruin our trip, so we spent the rest of the day at the lake, away from camp. Fast forward to bedtime. Obviously, my husband and I were having trouble falling asleep. At this point in our lives, we didn't own a gun yet, so all we had was a hatchet and a bowie knife to defend ourselves if need be. We started watching Planet Earth episodes we had downloaded on our Netflix account, hoping we would just fall asleep watching it. I was drifting in and out of sleep, and at around 10.30 to 11 p.m., I hear footsteps pacing around our campsite. I first told myself that it was an animal, but I couldn't figure out what kind. The footsteps seemed heavy, and they seemed to be in two places at once. For example, I would hear shuffling over by the campfire. Then, I would hear footsteps that seemed to be walking around the tent. 
I was scared and frozen stiff. My husband is perked up at this point, listening with me. This goes on for almost an hour before I eventually just fell asleep, trying to be as quiet as possible. My husband said he stayed up for another hour or so, but the sounds eventually stopped and he fell back asleep. Still have no idea who or what was hanging out at our campsite for so long, or why these dudes decided to camp so close to us in the middle of an empty forest. But we bought a gun pretty quickly after this relaxing weekend away. This was the scariest moment of my life, which happened while my friend and I were camping in eastern Canada as teenagers. We decided to sleep in this abandoned camper we found deep in a large forest that was near our town. It had been there so long that small trees had grown around it. We'd stumbled across it when we were exploring a few months back and thought it would be cool, and brave, to sleep there for a night. So, one weekend, we did it. We arrived after dark because we had gotten lost trying to find the camper. We had a really low power flashlight, so it made it even more difficult. Once we finally found it, we opened the rusty door and stepped in. The sounds inside the camper were shrill and echoey. There were typical camper things strewn about. Cups, empty cans, swollen pulp fiction novels. Already tired, we holed up in one end of the camper where the bed area had originally been before the cushions had rotted away to almost nothing. A long hallway stretched the length of the camper so we could basically see from end to end. It was a miserable night. There were several rats living in there. I saw them staring at us from a chewed out part of the ceiling. When the wind blew outside, the camper would shriek and groan. We even thought we heard a bear outside too, walking around. Still, we fiend bravery and acted like we were having a great time, but we were on edge. At some point, I woke up from an uncomfortable sleep. I sat up to adjust myself when I noticed some movement out of the corner of my eye. At the other end of the camper, there was a small window, and as I looked at it, I saw a man's silhouette. He was clearly staring straight at me from outside. At first, I thought maybe it was a weird shape of a tree or something. But when I moved a bit to get a better look, the person clearly reacted and then froze. My heart was pumping and I woke up my friend immediately, saying, Someone is here, over and over and over, in a whisper, not taking my eyes off his profile. He woke up immediately, and I nodded towards the window. He saw him too. We whispered frantically about who it could be and why was he staring at us. And for the next ten minutes, no joke, we stared him down. The longer we stared at him, the more frightened we got. Occasionally, he would move, but always keeping his eyes locked on us. Eventually, I shouted at him, Hey! No reaction. My friend was braver than me and decided to shine the flashlight at him. As soon as he did, we realized our horrible mistake. It wasn't a window at all on the other side of the camper. It was a mirror. We had been staring down ourselves from the very start. Completely idiotic. Still, it was the most fearful, relieving, and funny moment of my life that I'll never forget. Closest to paranormal I had ever been. I grew up in these forests, and I feel quite comfortable there. Nevertheless, I stumbled into a few unsettling situations there that would firmly stick in my mind forever. This was one such occasion. I was 18 at that time. One evening, me and my two friends, Mike and Paul, decided to go camping. Well, camping maybe isn't the right word, 
since we didn't intend to spend the night, only to chill and have some fun around the campfire for a while. The plan was simple. Head out, build a campfire, drink a few bottles of wine, eat something, and head back home for a good night's sleep. We met at my house when it was still sunny outside. We got ready and we headed out. Our destination was an old abandoned quarry in the middle of the woods, which was maybe 40 minutes from my house. Even though the quarry has a tragic and frankly creepy history, it's a popular place for such occasions. When we got there, the sky was already colored red as the sun slowly sank behind the hills. We quickly gathered all the firewood that we could so we wouldn't have to look for it later. As the darkness fell and absorbed all of the surroundings into impenetrable blackness, we already managed to get the fire going. We were in a great mood, and we were getting ready for our first toast. That's when we realized that we made a horrible mistake. We forgot the corkscrew. We were trying to open the wine without it, but we quickly gave up because the bottles were quite expensive and we didn't want to damage them. At this point, it was clear that one of us would have to sacrifice himself and jog back to retrieve the corkscrew. After a bit of haggling, I volunteered. However, I had two conditions. Firstly, they would give me a hatchet in case something went wrong along the way. Secondly, no pranks when I got back. Mike and Paul agreed without hesitation. They shoved a hatchet into one of my hands and a flashlight in the other, and they sent me on my way. As I was jogging through the forest, I heard a noise resembling a wild boar. Suddenly, I remembered a warning I received from an older hunter a few days ago. He said that this time of year, boars were getting dangerous, especially at night. I was a bit nervous, but luckily I managed to survive with no harm. I arrived safely to my house, much to the surprise of my mom who didn't expect me so early. I explained the whole ordeal. She just laughed. I grabbed the corkscrew and was back on my way. Not wanting to experience an unpleasant boar encounter, I chose another, slightly longer path this time through an open field. After a while, I got to our spot. It was a small clearing surrounded by one side by massive rocks, maybe 70 meters tall, and on the other side by thick forest. Somewhere in the middle of the clearing was our campfire. When I approached it, I realized that there wasn't anybody, although our backpacks were still on the ground and the fire was burning bright. Great. We specifically agreed that there would be no pranks when I got back. Those dicks think that they're being funny, I thought to myself. I resignedly sat down near the fire while facing the woods. That's the only place where those two assholes could have hidden, I thought. I was already tired and all I could think about was the taste of that exquisite Pinot Noir we had brought with us. I really wasn't in the mood for their games and I was getting quite mad. That's when I heard a snapping of twigs and rustling of leaves from the edge of the forest, maybe 30 meters from where I was sitting. The sound was rhythmical, and it was undoubtedly the sound of somebody walking. I aimed my flashlight to the spot where the sounds were coming from. Between the trees, I spotted a tall person wearing a dark hoodie. As I shined my flashlight on him, he stopped walking, turned to me, and just kept staring motionlessly. Even though he was directly facing me, I couldn't really see his face. I shouted, Paul, you fat ass, I know you're trying to scare me. We agreed on something, so stop messing around and come on out. As I finished, the hooded figure just turned around and walked deeper into the woods. Exactly at that time, my phone started ringing. Hastily, I took it out of my pocket. It was Mike. I took the call and started barking at him. Really funny, you assholes. I thought we agreed on something. What are you talking about? I'm talking about you trying to mess with me. I clearly saw you. You can come out now. Mike sounded as if he were frozen for a minute. 
for what seemed like an eternity. All I could hear was his heavy breathing and Paul mumbling something in the background. When he finally snapped back to reality, he just said, Dude, we're at your house. We heard some footsteps. At first, we just thought that you're trying to mess with us, but then we got scared and decided to look after you. I forgot the phone at your house, so we couldn't even call you. Just get the hell out of there, and we'll come back for our stuff tomorrow. Oh, bullshit. That's just another one of your funny pranks, and I'm not buying it. Hold on a second. For a while, all I could hear was some incoherent mumbling. Hey, what's going on? Asked the voice of my mom coming from the phone. My head suddenly spun and my heart skipped a beat as I realized that they were not kidding. Suddenly, a freezing wave of fear ran through my body. However, I managed to convince mom that everything was just fine that she doesn't need to worry. She gave the phone back to Mike. Just leave everything and come back. We're heading out now. We'll meet you halfway there. I'm not going anywhere alone again. You better get your asses here and do it quick. I'm waiting for you. But I hung up. I didn't wish to make any more noise than I already did. I quickly turned off my flashlight and started to back off from the light of fire. I moved all the way to the huge wall of rocks. I figured that if I had my back covered by the rocks, I would eliminate one of those possible ways the unwanted visitor could approach me. I was standing there in a complete darkness, trying not to make a sound while tightly clutching my hatchet, which would be for the next half an hour my best friend. I had to constantly convince myself not to curl into a ball in fear. Even my own body started to betray me as my hearing got worse due to my savagely beating heart. I was trying to calm myself, but then again, in worst case scenario, every little bit of adrenaline would help. After what seemed like an eternity, I spotted two weak light beams coming from the forest. I heard Paul shout my name. I've never been so relieved. I finally ran out of my hiding to greet my two friends. For quite some time, we were just standing there, laughing like maniacs from relief. We were even getting a bit cocky and we thought about staying. After all, there was just one, supposedly, creep lurking between the trees, and there were three of us. Funny, just minutes earlier, I was shitting myself with fear, and now... I was suddenly full of tough macho bullshit thinking, what could possibly happen? In the end, healthy judgment got the better of us and we decided to leave. We packed our things, put out the fire, and got out. We took our bottles of wine to enjoy somewhere else. Somewhere where it's nice and brightly lit. My friend Sally has had a bad run with neighbors, but this was one of the worst. Sally lives very close to me, about a 10 minute walk. We were both around 14 years old when this happened. We live rural, so we both have a lot of land. Me and Sally decided to go camping on our land. We bought cheap hammocks and went through the bushland. The days prior, we spent clearing some of the razor grass with a cane knife to make a path. We probably should have worn long pants because we ended up with little cuts all over our legs and some on our arms. We set up our hammocks and brought quite a few blankets because it does get pretty cold at night, even though you're sweating throughout the day. We were still on her property and hadn't gone to her neighbor's boundary. Her neighbor had just leased the land to the new tenants. Sally and I were sitting on our hammocks, talking and laughing. This was around 9 p.m. We heard something in the bush. We just thought it was a wallaby. There's plenty of wallabies around there. Then we could see a figure of a man. We were whispering to each other, trying to see who it was. At first, we thought it was her brother. He had came and scared us when we were camping previously. Then, as the person got closer, we were thinking it could have been her dad. 
It was dark and the bush looks the same from every angle. We realized the man was coming from the other direction than her house. We didn't dare move and covered our torches under our blankets. The man came up and said hi and introduced himself as Ben. Now, Ben was extremely drunk. He staggered around and he reeked of alcohol. He started saying how we had had a nice little camp here and said something pretty unsettling. I'll have to come out and sunbake naked here on one of these hammocks. Me and Sally gave each other worried looks but didn't say anything. It only got worse from there. I can't remember everything he said because it was a while ago and he was mumbling on for what felt like forever. But some of the things that stuck out were... I'll have to kill a wolf creek style and said you're nearly legal then when he asked us our age Ben was probably in his 40s me and Sally were texting each other while he was talking and coming up with an escape plan he also offered us a puff on the magic dragon and pulled out a glass pipe we declined Sally said that we were leaving back to the house to make food he told us to come back. We left our blankets and most of the stuff there and legged it. We told her dad what happened and we slept inside. The next morning, we went back out to the campsite to find everything burnt. A circle with probably a 20 meter radius was all burnt. Coming from that circle was a line of burnt grass going towards the neighbor's house. I'm not a firefighter or do forensics, but it seemed obvious that some kind of fuel was used. Me and Sally were talking, and it dawned on us the possibility that Ben may have thought we were in the hammocks due to the pile of blankets. Ben was definitely drunk enough not to be able to tell the difference. We went and told Sally's dad, who then checked it out and then went next door. Ben's roommate answered the door and said Ben wasn't home and apologized and even gave Sally's dad $50 for the blankets and hammocks. Nothing more happened for a few months. Sally told me at school about how Ben had been caught on camera sneaking around her yard. I went to her house after school because she was going to be home alone until her dad finished work. I ended up sleeping over there that night. That's when he came over. Ben was drunk and came out the front of Sally's house and started yelling, he accused Sally of stealing his dog. Sally's dad called the police. They arrested him. The next day, we found a knife in the yard. It wasn't from Sally's house. The police came again and we told them about the knife and they got the footage from the camera as well. I don't know what happened to Ben, but he no longer lives next to Sally. So Ben, wherever you are, I hope you get what you deserve. I joined my school's camp trip to Malaysia when I was 14. I no longer remember where it was, but it was pretty close to Pinyang. I loved camping, and this trip was pretty unique. The campsite was aimed to provide authentic experiences in Malaysia. I know it's touristy sounding, but it gave an interesting premise. Instead of camping on land near the beach, the campsite was on stilts about 500 to 800 meters away from the shoreline. It recreated those floating villages around Southeast Asia. There was a small hall, showers and bunk beds over the ocean blue. The toilets were just outhouses that empty into the salty brine below. You could even see your business float away. Incredibly gross, but memorable. A hundred teenage girls were going to sleep there for a week to experience village life, like climbing coconut trees and fly traditional melee kites. Midway through the stay, my camp leader had allowed my group to use our sleeping bags to sleep on the wooden square. We were lulled to sleep by the slow, gentle waves. The wooden boards floated over the high tides, warping and sinking with our collective weight. 
a night full of stars, the sea breeze was cool and fresh. A few girls woke up to use the toilet. We had to go in groups of three whenever we went. I rolled in my sleeping bag and watched the shoreline. I saw something floating on the waves. It was triangular and shrouded in black. I was too groggy to care, so I went along with the girls to use the outhouse. In the outhouse, something felt off. I felt watched in that cramped space. It didn't make any sense. I looked down into the ocean below and stood still. The dim light of the outhouse shined to something floating below me. A line was attached to shadowy figure. The end of the rope was attached to a metal object stuck on the floorboards at the edge of the hole. I nearly tripped on it while I walked in and thought it was a nail. The figure held onto the rope and was yanking it gently against the push of the waves. I realized the figure was floating on the triangular thing I saw earlier. My mind clicked with an eerie thought. It was a person. A real, breathing person. On a man-made raft. Holding onto a rope with a hook. And I was blocking his way in. The shadowy figure looked at me from down below. The whites of his eyes looking into mine. I couldn't scream. I felt the rush of my blood in my ears. The man smiled up at me as if he wanted me to complete the show. I backed out of the outhouse and walked back to my group. The two girls with me didn't notice my shivering. My camp leader picked up on my shaking hands and asked me to step aside. I told him what I saw. The camp leader nodded silently, like a big brother. He sternly told my group to enter our bunks quickly and silently. My group never caught on to what happened. They noticed my pale face, but I brushed it off to seasickness. Sleeping on the top bunk, I saw torchlights running around the perimeter of the campsite. The official story to the increased activity that night was one of the outhouse's floorboards broke and the camp leaders were trying to assess the damage. We completed the camp and went home. On the bus back home, my mind races about that night. How long was that man watching us? My group was on the main platform for a good hour and a half. He could have been scouting areas to climb into the campsite. If he was waiting to climb through the outhouse, waiting for his moment, did he watch the girls use it too? You could clearly see the ocean below. He could have a clear view too. I still get chills just thinking about it. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true, scary camping stories. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you kindly. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourself. I'll read to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night.